Hello, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Thank, you. <laughs> Thank you for being here on a Sunday morning. Welcome to the Esplanade Theatre Studio and welcome to the inaugural Asian Dramatists Network Symposium Day 2. Uh, oh, people are still trying to get seats, but I'll just carry on. No problem. I am very excited and honoured to moderate this session uh, of uh, collaboration, the interdisciplinary and the intercultural. It's quite a mouthful, but I am indeed very excited about it. My name is Hao Nian, by the way, and I'll be moderating this session. Uh, as we only have one and a half hours, I am going to really rush through uh, introductions of these speakers. Uh, and if you're from Singapore, they should actually need no introduction. Uh, but for the rest of you, you probably would have a handout or program. But basically, uh, on my extreme left, we have Alvin Khan. He is the founder and artistic director of The Necessary Stage TNS, a leading proponent of devising theatre in Singapore, and having directed at least more than 70 plays which have been staged locally and at international festivals. He has also been awarded a Fulbright Scholarship and in 1998 was conferred the Young Artist Award for Theatre. In 2010, Elvin was conferred the Chevalier des Arts des Art, the Letters by the French Ministry of Culture in recognition of his, his uh, significant contribution to the arts. The following year, he was awarded Best Director at 2011 Straits Times Live Theatre Awards for Model Citizens by Necessary Stage. And we have Kok Hing Luan, Artistic Director of Singapore Theatre Company Drama Box, nominated Member of Parliament and prominent figure in both the English and Chinese language theatres in Singapore. He has thus far directed 60 plays, including Kuo Pao Kun's The Spirits Play, From Theatre, Work, Trick or Treat, Her Story, and Drift. Ping Luan strongly believes in engaging the community in his works to promote critical dialogues about the world we live in. He is one of the most important theatre practitioners in Singapore advocating applied and engaged arts. And then we have Mr. Ken, uh, Dr. Ken Takakuchi, beg your pardon. He is a research fellow at the Theatre Studies Program Department of English Language and Literature, National University of Singapore. He obtained his PhD in Japanese studies from NUS, specializing in theatre translations, intercultural theatre and cultural policy. As a theatre academic, Ken was assistant convener of a conference titled Unfinished Business, Christian Jit's Performance Practice and Contemporary Malaysian Theatre held in Kuala Lumpur in January 2015. And by some strange coincidence, and you will know why, let me introduce Dr. Charlene Rajendran, who is a theatre educator, researcher and practitioner who currently works at the National Institute of Education, Nanyang Technological University. She researches issues of contemporary performance, identity, culture in urban multicultural contexts and develops arts-based dialog dialogic pedagogies that draw on contextually based knowledges to deepen critical and aesthetic thinking. Charlene has been involved as theatre director, performer and writer since she was a teenager. More recently, she has been dramaturg in a range of performance projects including both sites now, Gitanjali, I Feel the Earth Move, and it won't be too long. In January 2015, she convened a practice-based conference, strangely also entitled Unfinished Business, Christian Chit's Performance Practice and Contemporary Malaysian Theatre, uh, run by Five Arts Centre, organised by Five Arts Centre in Kuala Lumpur. Now how this is going to work today is uh, we have been experimenting and trying out new formats of talks and presentations. For the first 10 minutes for each of the speaker, they will do a brief introduction of their work in themselves. And after around 40 minutes, there will be a cross discussion among the four of them. And it will be clear why that the cross discussion is a very integral part of what's going to happen in the kinds of issues that will come up in dramaturgy pertaining to collaboration, the interdisciplinary and the intercultural. 
Saya tidak tahu. Okay. Um, good morning, everybody. Thank you very much to Hanyan Center 42 and the estimate for inviting me to be here particularly to be on this panel where I'm with four very good friends um, with whom I've done some very interesting thinking over the years. And um, yeah, earlier this morning we were talking about this, we were trying out the slides and after yesterday I feel that it should be becoming Pengganggu, but I really did prepare the slides before yesterday. Uh, just a little bit of background before I go on to speak about my work as a dramaturg and that is I'm not a trained dramaturg in the formal sense. But I think now looking back on it, I've been doing dramaturgical thinking, which we talked about yesterday, since I was 13, because I was involved in a children's theatre group led by Janet Pillay, pioneering children's theatre director, who's now involved in issues of cultural policy and heritage. And I didn't realize it at the time, but a lot of the theatre making we were doing was actually a post-colonial critique of theatre making at the time. And as a teenager, making and thinking and working and doing, and we took our theatre very seriously, um, began a process that has led to many other things. Working with Janet then led me as a young adult to work with a group of artists who then shaped in many ways and continue to shape my dramaturgical thinking, and they're a group called Five Arts Centre. Five Arts Centre was founded by Christian Jip, whom I mentioned yesterday, and another co-founder is here, Marion de Cruz, um, five co-founders came together from interdisciplinary arts to make a company and to make work that reflected contemporary Malaysia, drawing on the different art forms. So it was interdisciplinary, multicultural, etc. So from being actor and performer and then director, writer, I became an educator, researcher, um, and then only in the last few years found myself engaged with this word dramaturg, which happened by accident. The first time I was asked, or no, I wasn't even asked to be dramaturg, actually I was involved in a project with Heng Wan called PRISM, uh, IPS PRISM, and I had been involved as an artist, and then when we got together the same team to do both sides now, I didn't have the headspace to be an artist, but I still wanted to be involved, and thankfully they still wanted me to be involved. So then they said, how? So I said, okay, I'd be dramaturg. Well. <laughs> and really, I didn't know what that meant. They didn't know what that meant. And they said, okay, well, we'll see how. Um, and that's really what happened, for which I'm grateful. Okay, so let me say a little bit about then this experience of being dramaturg. Um, my first ex expedition as dramaturg, as I said, was in 2013, for both sides now, produced by Drama Box and Arts Box Collaborative. This is an interdisciplinary multi-arts project that calls itself an immersive arts experience that looks at the issues of death and dying. It was first located in the Kutek Quat Hospital lobby, then in 2014 in two outdoor community spaces. And the work was geared towards engaging the public in conversations about death and normalizing the work of preparing for its eventuality. Using film, theater, interactive installations and public talks, the project aimed at making it conducive and safe for the public to have difficult and risky conversations about this somewhat taboo topic. <coughs> to prepare for and dream up the project, the creative team of artists and producers would need to discuss ideas and propose ways of making this happen. And it was at these meetings that this dramaturg offered perspectives throughout questions about the framing, structure, content, etc. Everyone was involved in the dramaturgy, so my aim was to thicken the dialogue and prod the thinking. But I knew that eventually the decisions about what actually happened were left to the artistic director in one, and the artist to make the final decisions. So what does a dramaturg do, asked Powa, one of the main stakeholders and funders, in a debrief meeting to discuss the project. And I had to make up something on the spot. And I said something like, to provide critical dialogue and feedback. He looked satisfied enough. It got me thinking, what do I do in relation to such a wide range of art forms? and the process of thinking about community arts beyond the usual notions of a specific community with a neatly defined boundary or specific art form. What kinds of sensibilities and skills does this dramaturg need to have? And then in 2014, I was invited to become dramaturg for Gitanjali, I Feel the Earth Move, a devised work produced by The Necessary Stage. This was an interdisciplinary and intercultural theater production about an aging traditional dance teacher based in Madras 
and her relationship with her son who moves to Singapore and her star student who moves to Canada. The work engaged a classical dancer, classical singer, contemporary dancers, trained and untrained actors, experimental musician, designers, Harish Sharma as writer, and Alvin Tan as director, Felipe Severa as assistant director. Several languages and vocabularies of performance text were created through the devised process. The work was an ambitious attempt to make sense of these varied, sometimes colliding, <coughs> at other times colluding vocabularies in interaction. Again, my task to attend the discussion, mostly in rehearsals this time, give critical feedback, sometimes meetings with the writer and director and designers, to have further discussions about the process and the frame. But eventually the decisions were in the hands of the artists, the writer, the director, the actors. So how to dramaturg this very fluctuating and evolving work when so many skilled artists were already involved? Was I simply there to add flavor? If so, what flavor could I offer? When would I know what was useful, what was excessive, what would be too much? So in these projects, I'm fully aware that much as I may be a desirable option, I am completely dispensable. The directors and writers are themselves skilled dramaturgs. So if I have a role to play, it's as this extra ingredient that hopefully can make a significant and interesting difference. But if not, the production will go on just fine. The meal will still be a good one. Maybe even more so, who's to say? Too many flavors can sometimes spoil the dish? Depends on your taste. As someone who's wandered into becoming a dramaturg rather than setting out to be one, it's been an ongoing process of improvisation and exploration to find out about what this means, particularly in experimental projects, which are not easy to define or to describe. The truth is, I feel I've responded to some delicious invitations to participate in theater making. And my own appetite to keep being part of it has made me say yes without any, any hesitation within the demands of my full-time teaching job. And part of the luxury, actually, has been to know that I am desirable yet dispensable. <laughs> my involvement with each project has been significantly different. And so it'll take too long to go into the what and how, and I think that'll come up in the discussion later. So I've decided to say something about what seem to me two primary questions that come up when I think about what has shaped my experience as dramaturg in experimental and highly collaborative work. And these are the two questions. First one. Oh, sorry, this should have come earlier, but never mind. Where do I sit? When I enter the rehearsal space, I'm present. But my presence needs to be minimal. Likewise, in a meeting. I am present, but it matters where I sit. Imminence matters. And I know that sitting in a corner writing notes in my book has an effect on actors and directors. <laughs> so I try to remain out of the way as possible, but this changes with each project, with each phase of the project. It varies with each kind of meeting, where I sit, how I attend. How do I sit? The active viewing of the dramaturg as first spectator or critical spectator means that my watching is an intervention. I'm there to make comments, to discern concerns with the work, to raise problems, to ask questions. So it's an intense watching. And listening is part of my active presence. How I sit then, de uh, how I sit then affects how I see the project. So wherever and however I sit, I need to feel that I can sense and figure out what's going on. And if I'm missing something, should I say something now, wait later? What do I do with this building tension? How do I deal with the exhaustion? Am I showing too much on my face? Am I not showing enough on my face? How much is apparent from where I'm sitting? I'm not able to attend all rehearsals, so I had to catch up, fill in the gaps. Between the last time I was present, what has changed? Does it matter? As a practitioner who's been a director, performer, writer, etc., I'm watching through several lenses simultaneously. It's like having multifocal lens that allows for different kinds of focus and distancing. Sometimes I zone in on the actor's capacity to connect with text. Sometimes I'm thinking about what the producer is saying to the artistic director and the concerns of funding. Sometimes I watch the play of bodies in relation to sound. Sometimes I listen and I try to push against the silence. And on it goes. It shifts. It influences, though, what I'll say later. And to do it adequately, it matters where I sit and how I sit. Yes, it's about how I locate myself in the project. My role is not specified at the start. 
the negotiation is left open. Sometimes I need to be more absent than present. Sometimes I need to be more visible. It shifts with the needs of the project. So one example, in Gitanjali, I feel the earth move, I used to sit between the writer and the director. <laughs> the director sat next to the assistant director. Now, in the next phase of the project, Ghostwriter, I sit with the musician <coughs> on the same side because now the choreographer sits between the director and the writer. Things have changed. It's not power play that I'm pointing to, but it's just an example of how situations change and where I sit changes, and it's quite a delightful treat. For me, it's like attending a social event that I've been invited to in a home. I'm an invited guest. I need to figure out the dynamics of who's present, friends and strangers. I need to know where to best locate myself and then when to move around and shift places. Working out the dynamics is part of my responsibility when I accepted the invitation to come and join in the eating and drinking. I am meant to come with an appetite and a capacity to appreciate the food and the booze but also to bring something to contribute to the party apart from my presence, so what do I say? Apart from watching with intensity, I'm expected to respond and say something useful. What kind of conversation should I have? What sort of language should I use? Through comment, question, provocation, affirmation, uncertainty, a bit of whimsy, I jump into the fray, I become part of the work. Much more evident than just where and how I sit, perhaps. But is it really? I didn't train as a dramaturg, so I don't have a methodology. I improvise. Perhaps I'm a devising dramaturg. <laughs> and I respond to what I see and what I sense. But I do have a politics of theatre. That's implicit and that's explicit. It emerges through my choice of where to sit and what to say. But I cannot have claim to have a method or a technique. So what I say reveals a lot about me, I'm sure. My theatre appetite, my inclination. Sometimes I'm not sure if I'm there as a curiosity at the party to test whether something will work. To figure out if an idea is worth pursuing. After all, I'm meant to be the guest who says the least, but make sure they make sense when they say something. I do have an appetite for theatre, experimental theatre and experimental art making in particular. I enjoy being in these critical conversations, and I have the luxury of being a part-time dramaturg. I can be choosy about who I have these conversations with. That does make a difference. The conversations are multiple, multiple, they're multifarious, they move in many directions, but what has become increasingly important is being able to trust that the conversation matters and the people with whom I have these conversations matter as well. So I feel it's worthwhile, especially when the party heats up and there's something stirring in the discussion. How to find words to articulate the problems? Because I feel that I'm not just accorded space to speak about the performance, but also to the stories that are emerging, the real life experiences that are shaping the nature of the work. And what I say as Dramata contributes somehow to this overarching project. I take responsibility for it. But because I'm dispensable, I think my role is to say what nobody else might say. To stir the pot such that I prod the process beyond its realistic and yet perhaps imagined limits. These are experimental works, so they don't have a prescribed outcome that's directing their shape, texture and feeling. Hence the conversations are about what is coming up in the laboratories of the artist's mind, in the rehearsal space, in the meeting. What's making sense or nonsense? Yet, these are also fragile spaces. And they should not be pushed beyond a particular limit. How do I speak to these fragilities and these vulnerabilities even as I'm aware of the strengths. Have I assessed the situation and read the momentum? Did I hear it enough? Some of these conversations take place over several phases, like Gitanjali, I feel the earth move, and both sides now. Some of them are shorter, like it won't be too long, the cemetery. But they all involve a level of play and purpose. This dialogue is part of a ludic process, in a very liminal space that I enjoy in which the possibilities I imagine and entertain to create more advanced stages of the thinking about the work. But where I sit and what I say frame my work on a literal and metaphorical level, and I continue to ask myself, even as I sit here now, whether I should be seated elsewhere, or if I should have spoken quite differently. Thank you.
Hello, good morning. Um, so, uh, in this presentation, I would like to talk about my experience as a dramaturg and a so-called intercultural theatre practice. And uh, of course, the, uh, the issue of intercultural theater has been widely debated, and uh, I don't want to repeat it anymore. But um, for me, the intercultural theater is a um, um, theatrical um, practice which, bridge, which bridges the, uh, the different cultures. So it is a space where the, um, the practitioners from different cultural backgrounds gather and also negotiate the, uh, uh, the, uh, the, uh, their cultures and uh, um, the share the result of the process all, uh, with the audience. So for me, this, uh, the intercultural theater has always been a very process-oriented um, practice. And uh, my first involvement um, in an in so-called intercultural performance was back in 2001, uh, which was uh, titled The Island in Between. Um, um, written and uh, uh, written by the Malaysian um, Kamla Slan and uh, uh, Joe Kukatas, and uh, uh, it was directed by Kukatas herself, and it was fully funded by the Japan Foundation, and uh, which is um, the cultural institution um, set up by Japanese government. And uh, taking a, uh, a program booklet uh, to prepare for, uh, for this presentation, I found my name uh, under the category of Japan. Um, in, in the program booklet, <coughs> and it's true that you know the most of the intercultural performance, you know, the projects happen beyond the national borders, and um, but I would like to highlight that you know the, what is stake at stake here is that is um, not the the nation but the culture, and uh, I believe that the uh, the, uh, the, uh, the a drama talk uh, in the intercultural performance. Uh, has to be fully aware of this the trap of you know or the, uh, uh, to stick to the uh, the, the uh, to con to consider to think everything based on the uh, the nationality. Um, of course, you know the, uh, still the uh, the nation state is such a huge baggage, the cultural baggage for us, and uh, we can we can escape from it, and we shouldn't escape from that. But still, I believe that we shouldn't be too much trapped with that. And for me, the rehearsal room of the intercultural theater is a microcosm, the way people interpret others and themselves in a great diversity of idioms with expanded communication and intercultural influence. So Mihail Baksin called this kind of sphere the heteroglossia and pointed out that the language, the I quote, languages do not exclude each other, but rather intersect with each other in many different ways. And the ethnographer James Clifford added to this that what is said to languages applies equally to cultures and subcultures. So if th this is the case, I would like to argue that the, um, the, the act of bridging languages, which is usually called translation, should be considered as an important and uh, quite central part of the intercultural exploration in theater. And the role of translator as a linguistic slash cultural uh, mediator greatly overlaps with that of the dramaturg, with the role of dramaturg, uh, who is expected to be a cultural mediator in the intercultural performances. So that he or she provides a context on which each participant can absorb the elements that are, that are alien to him or her in the creative process and thus to facilitate the intercultural negotiations. And this kind of um, con conceptualization of um, the translator slash uh, dramaturg makes a very good sense to me because I started my involvement um, in the, uh, the theater making as a translator and the gradually, actually, the gradually acquired the role of dramaturg very o in, very, in very organic way. So the, I would say that my very first involvement um, as dramaturg was um, the, uh, this production called Reservoir, uh, which was produced by Theatre Works in 2008. <coughs> so I was invited by the, uh, by the company as a script translator. 
And uh, this project was themed uh, with the, uh, the Shonan Jinja Shrine, which was built by the Japanese army during the occupation. And uh, this shrine was built um, um, by the, uh, the Makrichi Reservoir, the largest reservoir in Singapore, that are located in the, in, in, the in the very central location of this island. And uh, it was destroyed when Japanese surrendered. And uh, I did a lot of uh, researches on, on this, and as I translated, and I shared it with the other, uh, with the other co-creators that in, in the course of production. And uh, I, I even uh, joined the, uh, the uh, site visit of this, uh, the ruins of, uh, of this um, the Shonan, Shonan Jinja. And you can see that we, that we are crossing the water uh, to get to the site. And uh, 30 seconds after I took this photo, I myself the, uh, crossed the water and I slipped and I was almost drowned. <laughs> so in the water, I was thinking, okay, why this script translator is drawing now? <laughs> Usually, a script translator doesn't drown. <laughs> so I felt, okay, I am doing something different. I am extending, you know, the, uh, my role in the process. And, uh, and, uh, and, it, uh, and uh, uh, yesterday, there was a discussion that the, um, there was a role, but there was no name was given to that. And I felt the same, the same thing the, uh, this, uh, in this project, because I was not credited, and I didn't call myself a dramaturg. But actually, I took a similar position in the uh, projects I that I participated in the translation, and the latest example was the, uh, the hotel, which was uh, um, done by the, uh, uh, the uh, local theater company Wild Rice uh, last year. Um, the, I continued uh, to get participated in the, in the intercultural performance in the, as a translator, but yeah, I gradually extended uh, my role as a dramaturg and uh, this is a project which is ongoing, and uh, um, the, uh, I am uh, doing this, uh, the residency in Japan in uh, the, uh, this coming summer. So this is uh, our uh, project to um, explore the possibility of collaborative translation by the, by the act with the actors and the, uh, the, uh, the director. But so far, probably the most um, extensive and the most complex um, intercultural project I, I participated as a dramaturg was Mobile 2, uh, Flat Cities, uh, which was um, the, uh, written by the Haresh Sharma and uh, directed by Arvind Tan of the Necessary Stage. Um, and it was actually the, uh, the very first production I started to call myself dramaturg because the uh, Haresh Sharma, one day Haresh Sharma told me, Ken, you are the dramaturg. <laughs> and then I, I started to call myself dramaturg. <laughs> And uh, uh, this was a new <coughs> work devised um, the, uh, by the, uh, the necessary stage, very si uh, the signature uh, three phase structure of the of devising. And um, and uh, I participated in this project from the very very early stage, and uh, we had a very specific theme. Uh, the, uh, to discuss in this project, which was the whole idea of the nation. So we studied this project by having discussions on this, on this issue. However, um, somehow, the, uh, unfortunately, um, due to some pra practical reasons, we couldn't have the second phase of the devising um, process that in which we, generally speaking, that we could aim to have uh, intensive discussions and the researches to, to concretize the narratives uh, to be included in the final production. As we were not able to uh, meet physically uh, to have workshop, workshop sessions, uh, we set up a Facebook feed instead, and which was actually the, uh, the idea of Arvin. Um, <laughs> Arvin, Arvin is known, very, very well known as a Facebook craze. <laughs> And uh, your thread is always filled with Urban's uh, post. <laughs> but anyway, um, so the, uh, but you know that this Facebook feed be, uh, tend to be a very very effective tool uh, for us to communicate and uh, develop our narratives. So the, um, so the all collaborators, the, uh, we set up this um, uh, thread in October 2012, which was 
more than half a year before the actual performance. No, it's, it's nearly a year before the performance. And the collaborators posted the articles, pictures, and the videos uh, related to the theme, and the episodes and the narratives they collected personally, and also the uh, thoughts on them and the reflections. The, at the end of the day, so after nearly one, one year of process, the, uh, the total number of the posts reached more than 1,000, and a uh, very, very wide extent of the uh, topics were covered. And it was a very unique and special experience for all of us because the all members constantly, you know, they were constantly engaged with the discussions for nearly, you know, or the, nearly a year. And, uh, um, and the posts were added all to the thread almost daily. So the, uh, it's a very, you know, it's a, a kind of daily routine to come back to this, uh, the, uh, the Facebook feed and uh, share the, the thoughts. And, um, and uh, as a dramaturg, um, I observed the discussions. And also, I somehow curated them. I facilitated them as well. And the translation, of course, took a very, very important um, portion of, of this process because every single post had to be translated from English to Japanese or vice versa. So the, uh, I translated this with uh, the, my co-translator um, the who volunteered kindly, um, uh, Ritsuko Saito. And, uh, um, and uh, we, as the course of translating these posts, it was a very, very important learning process for me um, to learn what are the gaps, perception gaps between these two, in, among the collaborators, and uh, um, where the gaps are. And uh, these gaps are not necessarily you know, between Japan and Singapore, but it was also the, um, the within Japanese team, we, we found quite significant perception gaps as well. So um, the, in, in, in this thread, my role was to fill the gap, to mediate these perception gaps, cultural gaps, that are by um, putting my own thoughts and questions. And, um, <coughs> And uh, this was also a very, very, you know, the important um, process for me to get prepared uh, for the uh, script translation. So the script was written by the, uh, the necessary stages uh, resident playwright Harishama, and uh, I translated it uh, into Japanese with my co-translator, now another co-translator, Nao Suzuki, and uh, I worked very closely with Arvin and uh, adjusted the Japanese translation, reflecting the findings in the final rehearsals happened in Singapore. So when Alvin changed the direction, I adjusted Japanese translation accordingly, and uh, the revision happened very often, especially in the first two weeks of the rehearsal process. And I continued the discussion with my co-translator, Nao Suzuki, who is based in Japan, and uh, using the, uh, the comment uh, the, uh, function of the, uh, the Microsoft Word, so you can see the, uh, the, our the, the trace, traces of our conversation that in, the, uh, in the Word document. So the, but that kind of, you know, or the, this kind of process, I would like to highlight that, you know, was possible um, only because the trust was established, you know, through the pre the, uh, pre all through the, uh, the pre preparation process. And there was a collaboration among the director, playwright, performers, and the translators, so many translators involved in this process, and the, and the drum took myself in the entire process. And, uh, and, it was, and I would say it is always very difficult question, as Sharin raised just now, mm -hmm. the how and the, how, can a, how can and should the drama talk intervene in the creative process? And the answer can vary greatly from the project to project. But yeah, uh, my experience in this uh, mobile too and all other, you know, all the, um, the translation, translator slash dramaturg experience uh, gave me a kind of model that I can follow, that uh, I can use in the inter intercultural uh, productions. And, uh, um, and uh, um, of course, th this is not 
necessarily possible in in every project. Of course, you know, and sometimes, of course, I, I myself um, do dramaturging without having translator's role. But still, I would argue that the uh, the combination of these two roles of the translate translator and the dramaturg can contribute in in some way or another the, uh, to the uh, the model of the dramaturging in the intercultural pro the uh, production and the process. Thank you. demonstration of what uh, dramaturging and directing is like. <laughs> so sometimes when you direct, you need to see in a lot of details, so I'll put this long side. <laughs> I can see close up on how the work is being made. The dramaturg, we need this one. You sort of need to distance yourself in the process. Uh, hi. Uh, <laughs> I am a director. But uh, I'm also dramaturg. So actually, uh, the, the, the relationship is actually very complex. And today, as I sit here, I wish I was sitting there because it's nice to hear a dramaturg talk about your work rather than you sitting here talking about how you dramaturg your work. Uh, it's not shown yet. Huh? Yeah, it is. Okay. Uh, so I, I feel that maybe in today's session, what I do is then, uh, uh, as a dramaturg, now I'm dramaturging the work that I've done, uh, but with actually a lot of inputs that came from uh, Charlene during the process. Uh, this is especially so when, uh, you know, there's some work that I do, actually I don't quite know what I was doing. So the process was actually quite uh, tedious. Uh, I would like to, to, to start by saying that actually the act of creating work is almost like the act of getting lost. Um, I, I met one of my favorite writers, Rebecca Sonnet, talk about loss uh, in, with two uh, disparate meanings. One, losing things is about uh, the familiar falling away. That means what is familiar and going away. Uh, and uh, the other kind is when you are you get lost and it is about something unfamiliar happening uh, appearing in front of you so uh, the first one uh, losing so when you lose something so what happens is that it's still familiar except the items are not there and you feel that sense of loss uh, the other kind is when you get lost in which uh, in this case the world will become larger uh, than the knowledge of it and I think those who are familiar with sorrow and uh, when he talks in war, then he talks about how getting lost actually opens up a world of actually discovering yourself. So I, I would always imagine that when a director gets into working, uh, actually uh, he, would, he or she would actually be discovering that world. Uh, and there comes a very important dramaturgical question a lot of time, even when I ask uh, the director of my work with, that very simple question is, why this work now? Uh, it could be because we talking about the content of a work in terms of its relevance, or it could mean why is it that it's important for this particular director or this writer who wants to do this work at this moment. It could be a kind of artistic exploration, it could be a kind of personal growth, but whatever it is, I find that question of highly meaningful, even for myself as a director or as a dramaturg to constantly ask myself. And with that, uh, then I was really looking uh, at, now I'm really looking at this project called the Both Sides Now. Uh, Both Sides Now is actually a project which uh, just now uh, Charlene has talked about, which is about living and dying. But not only that, it's actually part of a, 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 a program that I've been doing since uh, 2000, where I wanted to try out doing performances, not inside theatre, but in public spaces to redefine a kind of relationship between the audience and the uh, 
and the performance. Because uh, if because being in Singapore, I find that the public space are actually quite restricted, and actually even uh, this course actually are very restricted. So I thought that being naive, so let's do it in the public space and see how we can actually look at the idea of this course. And so the relation change. Uh, the aesthetic is in a way in very much in the relation, but this relation is also political in a way. So then from the relational aesthetic that we talk about in visual arts, we actually also talk about a kind of political aesthetic here. So when that happens, uh, one of the things that is of great consideration is actually what is this public space? How do you engage this public space? Uh, and in Singapore, actually because we're so small, right? Uh, find, to find good public space is difficult. Uh, public space that allows a conversation to happen. But at the same time, though Singapore is small, the people who visit this public space are actually very different and very complex. So it is not homogeneous when you look at community. It's actually very heterogeneous. How do you actually create that kind of space becomes a very important question that actually go through our discussion in this process. Uh, one of the things that uh, uh, I had here in this project was uh, both sides now, which is about living and dying a taboo project. Okay, uh, the, the advantage of having this is actually it had two iterations. The first one we did it was in the hospital. And the second one that we did it is uh, in really public space. And I had the advantage of a, a, a dramaturg who follow us through these two things. So as a director, I knew right from the beginning that you know when you want to do engaged performance, the first thing, you know, the, the, the sort of uh, structure or, or the way you want to approach is what Jen, uh, Jen Cruz Cohen had talked about as a call and response. So the work make a call and the audience responds, and the response become a call in that process. So it is interactive. It is interactive. So in the first iteration, we actually focus on the interactiveness of things. And it was an experience that we gained from PRISM, which was about governance. And when we talk about governance, we're talking about citizens, or Singaporeans, and the government. And it's not just about the government itself, the government and the government. So we're looking at that call and response relationship. However, after doing two iterations, I think one very important thing happened here. Between the call and the response, we realized, or one day, uh, Shalin also mentioned, through our observations of what happened in the performances work, we need another space in between. And we realized that that space was about listening. And now we're talking about listening, not in terms of just this, but listening with the five senses. So you can have your call, but you do not create a listening experience you actually would not have a response. So then, our dramaturgy actually went towards seeking for creating that listening, so now we start to call our own term uh, aesthetic, okay? The experience of listening and what does it mean? And I would define it as uh, creating the time and the space for you to listen. But what does listening mean then? A, for reflection. B, for an acknowledgement of the other at that moment. And C, actually, for a space then for you to respond so that deeper listening can happen. So it's very iterative. And I have to say, pedagogically, actually, I'm quite influenced by Paulo Freire, uh, the critical pedagogy of uh, uh, actions and reflections as part of the process in the engaged work that I do. So. So then it became, the work really became about creating the time and the space for people to, to actually respond. And we realized that this is a very complex thing which uh, as a team we have to work with. And just now Charlene has showed the team. The team includes producers. The team includes myself as artistic director and different artists and the dramaturg. And because of the number of people we have to work with, we realized then that the artwork is actually very complex. It is not just about the final performances that happen, but a lot of time it happened between us and the different stakeholders whom we are corresponding or talking to. It could be uh, the national health agencies who were interested in the issues but didn't know how to go about it and had never had any dialogues with any other stakeholders about this issue. So there were a lot of presentations that we made to all these national agencies, which in the end became like a performance. 
whereby you are actually facilitating their response with the needs of the community and then creating platforms for me which is a very interesting work so that they can work together so at the same time then i start to realize the structure we start to realize the structure was no longer you know this kind of uh, from a base and then you build 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 up to you know a kind of a triangular structure but i would describe the structure in a very rhizomic way or the other way which uh, i heard from mark pay which i like was actually multi-plugging okay which i like that idea so it really became a kind of structure that we both start to look at how to form that kind of a rhizomic system after all it fits because in the end if an engaged work is supposed to create a kind of space whereby people can communicate then it is not about creating a unitary utopia it would be a heterotopia a space where multiple voices and multiple possibility can happen uh, and then uh, so you see in this piece uh, we had to make time for people to communicate. Uh, you will see this is a forum theatre performances with a lot of audience in the evening, and they are all getting ready to talk about death. Uh, and they communicate and they shake hands with each other and then they sit down to watch a, a forum piece about how a young person is dealing with the immediate uh, or, or the coma of his father and whether to let his father just go. But there were also moments, oh, so you can see this, so at the same time, the piece also create very simple platforms whereby you have talks by lawyer. And the lawyers talk about things you need to do to prepare for death. So we are looking at, we are trying to pitch the whole work in different levels. From really very uh, simple kind of uh, talk to, come to performances. And then you would also have, importantly during that, a lot of uh, quite space as I would call just to allow the public to sit there and not do anything or even to talk to people so you will see this elderly gone to the because the, it has a number of series of activities within the public space so they will have seen the piece of it then they go and buy the waluku <laughs> and they come back there and they eat and then they continue but there were also some reflective space so the artwork that actually requires them to reflect their lives and then they start to, you know, jot down their, their, uh, the journey of their life. So like, you see being diagnosed with lymphoma. And yet, all these are displayed. To be a response, it became a call whereby the audience responds. So the call and response require a lot of time and space and it happens from 10 a.m., right? 10 a.m. to 10 p.m. People coming in and go. So in both sides now, uh, it... The, the whole thing actually had both uh, Charlene being the dramaturg who would always ask questions but the producers became very important there were two producers one producer looking at how the work will be put up the other producer actually looked at connecting all the various stakeholders which is this organization called the Arts Walk and we spent close to three to four months constantly meeting discussing and then whatever ideas I put up I get challenged uh, and then get re reorganized and Charlie would always sit there and listen and then someday we just ask you one question and you go okay let me think about it and I think that space is so important because while you meander into this whole rhizomic structure actually you, you it's hard for you to see it from a mic micro perspective uh, I think this kind of work has become important, at least in my company, whereby we then realize that dramaturgically, it no longer makes sense, sometimes it doesn't make sense to do just one work about one topic. We realize that it has to engage on multiple level. So, uh, the last work that, uh, this was done in 2015 uh, uh, in Sifa, where we were interested in the contestation especially land contestation in Singapore. As I said, the land is small. Uh, so there was this, this, this uh, cemetery, which is one of the oldest Chinese cemetery, uh, cemetery in Asia. It was going to, part of it was going to be excavated. About 5,000 graves were supposed to be removed. In the end, it was 3,000. So uh, that happened in 2011. 
And uh, when I finally did this, this, this performance, part of the road was starting to be, you know, part of the cemetery was starting to be uh, removed. But it was a, tree, uh, a trilogy in a way. The first part was actually this piece called The Cemetery, which happened in the cemetery in the morning at uh, 5.30 a.m. So audience will come and watch the piece at 5.30 a.m. It's completely uh, wordless, it's just movement. I think that time dramaturgically, we just wanted people to experience the space. Take it in its glory, from darkness to when dawn comes, and see the change that happened in the space. And there will be physical perform uh, uh, performances there. And then after that, in the evening, they will go to a theatre in uh, Sota, and the space is actually rather is empty up, and then with the map of the, the cemetery being drawn on the floor, the same actors who were doing the, uh, the, the, the physical performance were there, and then we had a verbatim theatre that actually records or that documents the struggle between the government and the NGOs in, in the contestation of that case. Uh, there was a dramatological problem there, which I don't know whether we have solved it in the end. In most uh, verbatim theatre, you actually would interview the victims. But in this case, the perpetrator was there, in a way. Uh, we, we had the advantage of actually interviewing the minister then who was in charge of this project. So you have the story of the ministers, you have the story of the people who felt that you know, they should be saving this place. And how do you actually dramatize a piece that has these two uh, voices? And of course the artist has a position. Yet there is the voice at the same time. The ethics behind it becomes very complex, and we had to go through it. I'm still thinking whether how far we, you know, we have achieved, you know, any sense of that thing. But the one more thing that we, uh, this was the one that was done in the theatre, okay. And the last piece that we felt that if we had done all this inside the theatre and in the cemetery, probably we only reach out to a certain group of audience. We wanted to reach out to the public at the same time and engage them in the performance. And there is this piece called The Lesson, which what you see is this little goalie, which is uh, our inflatable theatre that we bring from places to places. Uh, so in this, in this piece, which is called The Lesson, we actually create an interactive kind of a setup whereby audience participate in deciding how to, whether, uh, how to, the contestation of a piece of land to be removed to build an MRT. And they were fully involved in being participants. There was no play. It was just a situation facilitated by facilitators so that they make choices and they learn about democracy. They think they, they, were, they were questions about choice and uh, decisions. So that it will bring back to the whole issue of actually land and of course, how do we make choice in such a complex world? So uh, we have realized actually as a director and as a dramaturg, while I'm doing all this work, I find that it's always difficult to navigate such a complex, uh, at least for me, this kind of setup. And so I thought that a lot of time having Charlene being the outsider became so important because uh, she, she would point out to me when I'm lost. But I think being lost is fine. Actually, I enjoy the moment of being lost. But at the same time, there is something that I think is important in the sense that while being a dramaturg, you tend to want to create a structure such that you know it's neat and you know everything can fall into place. But I think sometimes as art maker, we just want those little weird moments where like, you just go, ha. Huh. <laughs> I think that tension is always healthy. And the uh, interrogation of it with the dramaturg makes it extremely meaningful. You may not know where it goes to, but at least you know the journey has started. Thank you.